born in Providence, Rhode Island in 1927. He was educated at Princeton and the University of Rochester. He has taught at several American universities. In 1963, he was a field worker for the Congress of Racial Equality. Galway Connell has received several awards for his poetry, of which there are some nine collections. He has published a novel and translations of Billon, Yves Bonfoy, and Yvon, Yvon Gall. The writing of Galway Connell ranges from poems that are transparent and lyrical to poetry that enters into nature and the animal world in order to discover original states of being. Great as his achievement already is, Galway Connell is still developing. He has the strength of feeling and the intelligence to explore new veins of poetry. He's one of the outstanding poets of the United States. Let me help you with this Galway Connell. Yeah, it's really a nuisance. Well, I'd like to read uh, <clears throat> a few uh, new and newish poems and then a few uh, old ones. <clears throat> this is called Wait, and it's addressed to a person who uh, wants to uh, commit suicide. Wait for now. Distrust everything if you have to, but trust the hours. Haven't they carried you everywhere up to now? Personal events will become interesting again. Pain will become interesting. Hair will become interesting. Buds that open out of season will become interesting. Secondhand gloves will become lovely again. Their memories are but give them the, the hope of other hands. And the desolation of lovers is the same. That enormous emptiness carved out of such tiny beings as we are asks to be filled. The need for the new love is faithfulness to the old. Wait, don't go too early. You're tired. But everyone's tired, but no one is tired enough. Only wait a little and listen. Music of hair, music of pain, music of looms weaving all our loves again. Be there to hear it. It will be the only time, most of all, to hear the flute of your whole existence rehearsed by the sorrows, play itself into total exhaustion. St. Francis and the Sow. <clears throat> the bud is the emblem of all things, even of those things that don't flower, because everything flowers from within of self-blessing. Though sometimes it's necessary to reteach a thing its loveliness, to put a hand on its brow of the flower and retell it in words and in touch, it is lovely until it flowers again from within of self-blessing. As St. Francis put his hand on the creased forehead of the sow and told her in words and in touch, blessings of earth on the sow. And the sow began remembering all down her thick length from the earthen snout all the way through the fodder and slops to the spiritual curl of the tail, from the hard spininess spiked out from the spine down through the great unbreakable heart to the sheer blue milk and dreaminess spurting and shuddering from the 14 teats into the 14 mouths sucking and blowing beneath them, the long, perfect loveliness of sow.
I feel the same. I mean, it's not my business, uh, but I feel the same as Adrian Mitchell does about applauding for poems. Uh, I think it would be better if we could ac accumulate all the scattered applause uh, from each poem and save it for a <laughs> to get a little resonance at the end. <clears throat> this is called The Choir. Little beings with their hair blooming so differently on skulls of odd sizes, and their eyes serious and their jaws very firm from singing in Gilead, and with their mouths gaping, saying, Ah, for God, O, oh, for an alphabet only of O's, they stand in rows, each suspended from a fishing line hooked at the breastbone, being hauled up toward the heavenly gases. Everybody who sings becomes beautiful. Even sad music requires an absolute happiness. Eyes, nostrils, mouth strain together in quintal harmony to sing joy and death well. <clears throat> Fergus is the name of uh, my son who last summer fell out of a pine tree and um, <clears throat> 30 feet out of a pine tree and uh, <clears throat> survived and this recounts the story of his fall it's called Fergus Falling <clears throat> climb to the top of one of those million white pines set out across the emptying pastures of the fifties, some program to enrich the rich and rebuke the forefathers who cleared it all once with ox and axe, climbed to the top probably to get out of the shadow, not of those forefathers but of this father, and saw for the first time down in its valley, Bruce Pond, giving off its little steam in the afternoon. Pond where Clarence Akeley came on Sunday mornings to cut down the cedars around the shore. I'd sometimes hear the slow spawn days of his work. He's gone. Where Milton Norway came up behind me while I was fishing and stood a while before I knew he was there. He's the one who put the cedar shingles on the house. Some have curled or split, a few have blown off. He's gone. Where Gus Newland logged in the cold snap of 58, the only man willing to go into those woods that never got warmer than 10 below, he's gone. Pond where two wards of the state wandered on Halloween, the National Guard searched, searched for them in November in vain. The next fall, a hunter found their skeletons huddled together in vain. They're gone. Pond where an old fisherman in a rowboat sits, drowning hooked worms. He goes, but he's replaced and is never gone. And when Fergus saw the pond for the first time in the clear evening, saw its oldness down there, its old place in the valley, he became heavier suddenly in his bones as fledglings do before they fly and the soft pine cracked. I would not have heard his cry if my skill saw had been working, its carbide teeth speeding through the bland spruce of our time, or burning black arcs into some scavenged hemlock plank, like dark circles under eyes when the brain thinks too close to the skin. But I was sawing by hand, and I heard that cry as though he were attacked. We ran out. When we bent over him, he said, Galway, Ines, I saw a pond. His face went gray. His eyes fluttered closed, a frightening moment. Yes, a pond that lets off its mist in the clear afternoons of August, in that valley to which many have come for their reasons, from which many have gone, a few for their reasons, most not 
where even now an old fisherman only the pine tops can see sits in the dry gray wood of his rowboat waiting for pickerel. <clears throat> A little further out on uh, Long Island uh, lives Alan Plans, who is a poet and a fisherman. <clears throat> His wife died last summer, and I wrote this poem dedicated to him called Fisherman. <clears throat> Solitary man standing on the Atlantic, high up on the flood tide under the moon, hauling at nets which shudder sideways down under the muted darkness. The one you hugged and slept with so often, who hugged you and slept with you so often, has gone away now into that imaginary moonlight of the greater world and looks back at this abandoned man standing on the flood tide who hauls at nets and drags from the darkness anything and feels tempted to walk over and touch him and speak from that world to which she acquiesced so suddenly dumbfounded and spirit broken but instead she only sings in the seabirds and breeze you imagine you remember but that you truly hear making you remember as dawn breaks in streaks across the fish flashed waters i don't know how you loved i don't know what marriage was and wasn't between you not even close friends understand anything of that but i know ordinary life was hard the two of you grapple side by side with the hard, ordinary difficulties, and worry joined your brain's faces in pure, baffled lines. And therefore, the earthliest, most caring part of you must go with her, imprinted into her, now imprinted into that world which only she doesn't fear any longer, which therefore you've stopped fearing and wait there to recognize you into it after you've lived, lived past the sorrow, if that happens after all the time in the world. Well, there are two kinds of lava. Um, <clears throat> there are probably more kinds of uh, two principal kinds of lava. One is called Aa, and the other is called Pahoy Hoy. And uh, <clears throat> Aa is that lava which breaks up as it cools and forms a layer of rubble on top. But Pahoy Hoy um, uh, cools in the, and remains in its river-like form. This poem is called. Ah, ah. I want to be pahoy hoy, swirled, interestingly lined, folded, frozen where I flowed, a clear, brazen surface one can cross barefooted. It's true. But even more, I want to be, ah, me, ah, ah, a churned up mass of rubble still tumbling after I've stopped which someone with bare feet has to do deep, knee tr deep treads across, groaning, ah, ah, at each step, and be used to build a cairn through sea spray on some empty coast, feeling in my cells the crab lysish clasp of ah, ah, holding on to ah, ah. And when I reach the dismal shore, all made of a hoy hoy, which is just, I know, the hoy polloi of the slopes. I don't want to call a hoy, a hoy, and sail meekly in. Uh uh. <laughs> no, let me turn and look back at that glittering world of black ah uh -uh, where we loved in the bright moon, where all our atoms broke and lived, where even now two kneecaps gasp. 
ah, ah, to the stone floor of the world. And the world answers, ah, once in commiseration with bones that find the way very long. And ah, twice in envy of yet unbroken bones. <clears throat> now I'm going to read uh, a couple of older things. This one is very old. It's one of the earliest poems I ever wrote, and it's called uh, First Song. If I can remember how it starts. Uh, um, um, then it was dusk in Illinois. The small boy, after an afternoon of carting dung, hung on the rail fence, a sapped thing weary to crying. Dark was growing tall, and he began to hear the pond frogs all calling on his ear with what seemed their joy. Soon their sound was pleasant for a boy listening in the smoky dusk and the nightfall of Illinois. And from the fields, two small boys came bearing cornstalk violins, and they rubbed the cornstalk bows with rosins, and the three sat there scraping of their joy. It was now fine music the frogs and the boys did in the towering Illinois twilight make. And into dark, in spite of a shoulder's ache, a boy's hunched body loved out of a stalk the first song of his happiness, and the song woke his heart to the darkness and into the sadness of joy. And this is a section from uh, a long poem, The Book of Nightmares. Uh, the section is called Dear Stranger Extant in Memory by the Blue Yatta. <clears throat> and the uh, the stranger in the poem is a woman by the name of Virginia, uh, who I uh, corresponded with but uh, never met. And a couple of her letters are quoted in here. The Juniata is a river in, in southern Pennsylvania. Dear stranger extant in memory by the blue Juniata. <clears throat> Having given up on the desk man, passed out under his clock, who was to have banged, it is morning, on the police-locked sheet metal door. I can hear the chime of the old tower, tinny sacring bell drifting out over the city, chime of our loves, the peristalsis of the will to love forever drives down, grain after grain, into the last coldest room, which is memory, and listen for the maggots inhabiting beds old men have died in, to crawl out, to break into the brain and cut the nerves which keep the book of solitude. Dear Galway, it began late one April night when I couldn't sleep. It was the dark of the moon. My hand felt numb. The pencil went over the page, drawn on its way by I don't know what. It drew circles and figure eights and mandalas. I cried. I had to drop the pencil. I was shaking. I went to bed and tried to pray. At last I relaxed. Then I felt my mouth open. My tongue moved. My breath wasn't my own. The whisper which forced, its, forced itself through my teeth said, Virginia, your eyes shine back to me from my own world. Oh God, I thought. My breath came short. My heart opened. Oh God, I thought. Now I have a demon lover. Yours, faithless to this life, Virginia. At dusk, by the blue Juniata, a rural America, the magazine said, now vanished but extant in memory, a primal garden lost forever. You see, she told her mother, we just think we're here. The root hunters go out into the woods, pull up love roots from the virgin glades, bend the stalks over shovel handles and lever them up, the huge base final thrump as each root unclutches from its spot. Take kettle of blue water, boil over twig fire of ash ashes, 
grind root, throw in, let soak, reheat over ash ashes, bottle, stopper with thumb of dead man, ripen forty days in horse dung in the wilderness, drink, sleep. And when you rise, if you do rise, it will be in the Sothic year, made of the raised salvages of the fragments all unaccomplished of years past, scraps and jettisons of time mortality could not grind down into its meal of blood and laughter. And if there is one more love to be known, one more poem to be opened into life, you will find it here or nowhere. Your hand will move on its own down the curving path drawn down by the terror and terrible lure of vacuum. A face materializes into your hands and the absolute whiteness of pages, a poem writes itself out. Its title, the dream of all poems and the text of all loves, tenderness toward existence. On this bank, our bank of the blue vanished water, you lie crying in your bed, hearing those small thrumps of leave-taking, trespassing the virginal woods at dusk. I too have eaten the meals of the dark shore. In time's own mattress, where a sag shaped as a body lies next to a sag, graves tossed into it by those who came before, who loved here, or ground their nightmared teeth here, or talked away their one night stands, the sanctus bell going out each hour to die against the sheet glass city. I lie without sleeping, remembering the ripped body of hen, the warmth of hen flesh frightening my hand, all its desires, all its death smells blooming again in the starlight. And then the wait, not long, I grant, but all my life, for the small, soft thud of her return among the stones. Can it ever be true, all bodies, one body, one light made of everyone's darkness together? Dear Galway, I have no one to turn to because God is my enemy. He gave me lust and joy and cut off my hands. My brain is smothered with his blood. I asked, why should I love this body I fear? He said, it is so lordly, it can never be shaped again, dear shining casket. Have you never been so proud of a thing you wanted it for your prey? His, vo his voice chokes my throat, soul of asps, master and taker. He wants to kill me. Forgive my blindness. Yours in the darkness, Virginia. Dear stranger, extant in memory by the blue Juniata, these letters across space, I guess, will be all we will know of one another. So little of what one is threads itself through the eye of empty space. Never mind. The self is the least of it. Let our scars fall in love. Now, I just want to uh, end by reading a fragment of another section <clears throat> in which uh, the same, uh, same Fergus who fell from the pine tree uh, gets born. A black bear sits alone in the twilight, nodding from side to side, turning slowly around and around on himself, scupping four-footed circle into the earth. He sniffs the sweat in the breeze. He understands a creature, a death creature, watches from the fringe of the trees. Finally, he understands, I am no longer here, he himself from the fringe of the, of the trees, watches a black bear get up, eat a few flowers, trudge away, all his fur glistening in the rain. And what glistening? 
Sancho Fergus, my boy child, had such great shoulders. When he was born, his head came out, the rest of him stuck. And he opened his eyes, his head out there, all alone in the room. He squinted with pained, very unglued eyes at the ninth month's blood splashing with him on the floor. And almost smiled, I thought, almost forgave it all in advance. And when he came wholly forth, I took him up in my hands and bent over and smelled the black, glistening fur of his head as empty space must have bent over the newborn planet and smelled the grasslands and the ferns. Thank you.